Um, so when I was approached to, uh, to come in and talk with you, I, first off, I was flattered and thank you for having me. Um, I said, well, what do you want me to talk about? What can I share with you? And they said, talk about Jazz Fest, talk about uh, you know, what you think past, present, future. So I feel like there's a few things that I should share because I do have a, a, a nice, strong link to this Jazz Festival in a variety of ways. So I thought I'd tell you a little bit about myself and uh, how I ended up in this position. Then I wanted to tell you a little bit about the Jazz Festival we have this year and uh, some of the things I see to come over the next couple of years. Um, so, my name is Josh Skinner, and I've been associated in a capa one capacity or another with this Jazz Festival since 2007. Since 2007. Um, I, uh, I, as, let's even flash back before that, I had exposure to the Jazz Festival back in 2000 to 2004. As a, I was an undergrad student at Utah State University, and my particular band director happened to bring that ensemble up every year to the Jazz Festival. His name was Larry Smith, and he happened to be very close with the, uh, um, at the time, the executive director, Lynn Skinner. They went to grad school together, and Lynn ended up here, and Larry ended up at Utah State, and that's ha that happens to be where I did my undergraduate work at, and. We would come up every year, and the most fascinating thing to me was Larry would uh, talk to us, and he'd get us sat down in the stands, and he'd say, this is one of the most unique jazz festivals. He said, you have this opportunity to hear all these world-class artists on one stage that you wouldn't hear anywhere else. And I had no idea what he was talking about. And he, the student performance part was great that we did, but we just had no idea what we were encountering until the first time that I came. And I actually had the opportunity to see the Ray Brown Trio. And with my small connection to Lynn, which I'll talk about here momentarily, Lynn quickly grabbed me and introduced me to a lot of those artists that I was looking up to at the time. I was a little bit unaware of kind of their stature at that time. I knew how big they were, but I just did not realize that we were kind of I was having this opportunity to take incredible musicians. Um, so, already I had two people ask me, well, what's your connection with Lynn? So, I can uh, talk about that. So, Lynn Skinner and my dad are cousins. And my dad and Lynn, uh, so Lynn grew up in southern Idaho, and I'm born and raised in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, Mesa, that's where I was born. And that's where most of my dad's family brothers are still located. But during the summers, my uh, grandpa was an educator, he would come up to southern Idaho, next door to Lynn, and work. So my dad and Lynn were very close, um, but I didn't really get to know Lynn until I was a college student. He was one of those individuals that I would come across every now and then, and I'd hear about him. So really, the, my exposure to Lynn Skinner was those first few festivals in the early 2000s, and him just saying, I know your dad, let's go, let's meet some artists. That was my first exposure to the Jazz Festival. Um, and then flash forward to 2006, 2007, I had been teaching uh, public schools down in Phoenix. And one of the things that I had always wanted to do was to get, get a graduate degree. So I started applying for schools, and we actually hit a nice little economic crunch. And it was a perfect time for my wife and I to step away from what we were doing. And actually, I came up to do a grad degree up here. Um, and there's a couple things that drove me up here. I had applied to a bunch of programs, and I ended up here in 2006. Um, one, because of the Jazz Festival. Two, there was a new faculty member that was hired named Bert Sealer. It's now been here for just over 10 years. And uh, three, uh, Lynn Skinner mentioned, hey, this guy named uh, John Clayton's going to be involved, and I think you should come get involved with him. As a bass player, that was my instrument. So there were some things that uh, kind of drove me this way, and we ended up being here. And um, Almost immediately I got involved uh, as a grad student with the Jazz Festival office. Um, actually, uh, at the time, Kevin McClure reached out to me and said, hey, um, we need someone that has music knowledge to help us with a few items, and you seem like a good fit as a grad student. And so I started getting my exposure 
with the Jazz Festival internally there, and from 2007 forward, I was hired in a variety of different capacities, from an educational advisor, to running their HAMS club, to helping with the Jazz in the Schools program. Um, so kind of all these different components. Um, and I was coming from the outside in. Uh, most recently, um, kind of, Flash forward to today, this is my first year as, as a, as a full-time employee with the Jazz Festival. So being the uh, managing director of the festival, uh, this is my first year being on full-time with them instead of being an external contractor. Um, my wife, um, and this will be in trouble. It's 2019, right? 2019-18. I think this is her fourth year as a, as a jazz faculty uh, with the University of Idaho. Fourth or third. I was teaching at Utah State University and then followed by University of Minnesota Duluth. And so I had been on the road traveling back and forth with our family. And she, our family is based out here, but I was commuting back to those schools and uh, still advising and helping with the jazz festival. This last year when I was at the University of Minnesota Duluth um, and uh, I saw this opportunity pop up, it made a lot of sense for me to see if, uh, see if I was a good fit. And uh, the committee felt like I was a good fit, and I ended up accepting the position um, in July of 2018. And so I, I resigned from uh, University of Minnesota Duluth and took over in July, and it's kind of been a uh, whirlwind from there, so to speak. So that's a little bit of my background. Um, it, I, like I had mentioned here, I did a master's degree in actually music performance and music education here at University of Idaho. And I went off and did my doctorate in uh, jazz studies and classical performance um, at uh, one of the big jazz schools in the country, University of Northern Colorado. And uh, I'm still very much an active musician to this day. Um, I uh, quite frequently perform at the Utah Symphony down in Salt Lake. Um, I sit in with Walla Walla when, uh, when I can, and uh, they've, they've kind of recruited me and, recently released an album with my wife uh, last year and have a couple more coming up over the next couple years. So I still stay very grounded to the musical world um, within education and performance because to me that's all one one thing which is also what I see the jazz stress be. I'd be happy to answer your question now or later. So what is your title now? Yeah. So I'm the manager of the Lionel Hampton Jazz Festival and we are officially part of the uh, Lionel Hampton School of Music okay. and the College of Letters and Arts and Social Sciences. Okay. Um, which that's kind of made a couple transitions where it's been external and internal. Two years ago, this would be the third year, um, the uh, Jazz Festival, kind of being an external unit, came under the umbrella um, of the School of Music. So it's always been associated um, under Dean Aiken when she was, uh, when she was the dean. Um, it's always had an association with the provost's office and the college, but it was about two years ago, this being the third season, that uh, we came back under the School of Music, Good. which was very important. Yeah. And uh, we've had some really great things come of that. Um, one of those being uh, me being the manager, I have, a, I have a group of teaching assistants that they're part of their teaching mode and responsibility is helping plan the festival. And it's incredible for them to have this opportunity of seeing an event on paper and then helping execute that and understanding the logistics of what it takes to uh, get all of our artists here, get all of those students here, because we'll have uh, just over 4,000 plus students here um, that are performing, and that doesn't include any of our concert goers or patrons or parents or chaperones. Um, and we've seen a nice rise in attendance uh, with the student performances over the last two years. Um, so, yeah. Thanks. So you're the one who gets yelled at. All the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I'm always happy to, uh, you know, I, I feel like we have this incredible event here kind of in a bigger scope for a lot of things. One of those being the student performances. Mm -hmm. uh, we draw a lot of Pacific Northwest schools, all, all the way up into Canada, about 33% of the schools coming come from Canada, uh, specifically BC. 
Um, this year we actually have a university coming out from Minnesota, uh -huh. and he contacted me. He actually teaches at University of Minnesota Morris, and Morris is far, far west edge border of Minnesota. Which um, one? University of Minnesota Morris. The uh, university, okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, Minnesota has. Yeah, so he, he's the director of jazz studies at University of Minnesota Morris, and he actually contacted me. We were both in that University of Minnesota system. I was in Duluth, he was in Morris, and he contacted me saying, is the Vanguard Orchestra really coming out? And I said, yes. He said, it's cheaper for me to bring my students to you, perform, get feedback, see this, this artist, than to try to get them to New York to see this group. Okay. So I'll talk about that. But the student performance component is this great opportunity to get students to Moscow, see what we're all enjoying, see this beautiful city, see the beautiful campus, because all student performances take place on campus, and really becomes kind of a recruiting tool, because I think anyone uh, that's been in any type of recruiting function understands, especially at a university setting, yes, it's great to get them on campus, but they also have to see a community, because any parent out there they're sending their kid off, and, which I'm sure almost every one of you have. You're concerned about their well-being. How's the environment? How's the local community? Um, and so I think our community is a huge part of the recruiting of getting students here. And the Jazz Festival is a great tool just to get individuals here. Because from my perspective, the vast majority of students that uh, get influenced by the Jazz Festival to come to the University of Idaho won't ever be a music major. Uh, they might participate in ensembles. They're probably going to go on to be an engineer, go on to be a, you know, a business major, one of the many other opportunities that uh, the university offers. So to me, it's just a great tool that we have to uh, bring these students in. These student performances are fantastic because they get to work with uh, adjudicators, individuals that we bring in um, from across the country. These students get to perform, and then they get to hear critical feedback. Uh, you know, hey, this is this is how your performance was. We'll get you to the next level here. This is what you need to, need to do to get to that next level. Um, and it's kind of funny. Those of us that have been in any type of educational setting or have worked with students, it's always funny to me when I work with a student, especially one on one, and say, this is this is what you need to do to be successful get to this next level. And you know, I, I spell it out very clearly. And then I'll send them off and they'll work with someone like at our festival. They'll say the exact same thing and suddenly they'll be like, did you know that they said this and that's what I need to do? And it's like, yeah, you know, that's what we've been talking about. They're like, oh yeah. So it's great for educators that always get that, so to speak, second opinion and to get uh, help because not only are those educators, they're, they're getting refresh, so to speak. Um, they're getting that input uh, from their professional colleagues as well. Um, so the student performances are very, very important. Um, two years ago, this will be the third year, uh, a competitive portion was brought back to the festival um, that had been in place for years and then it went away for a little bit uh, during the uh, mid to late 2000s and we brought that back. And then, that's important for some schools. We offer two tracks, a competitive and a non-competitive. Some school schools and school districts feel it's very important to have that competitive, competitive component. And other schools, they just want that experience of that educational feedback. So we try to cover that broad spectrum and cater to those individuals that want that. So we definitely have that in place as well for the student performances. Those student performances during the festival typically start about 8 a.m go till about 4 o'clock, and pretty booked throughout the entire day. Um, and it's fantastic to see just about 20 ensembles in one performance venue, like if you're familiar with the uh, International Ballroom there in the Pittman Center. About 20 ensembles will go through there on Friday and another 20 on Saturday. Um, and that's one of the six large venues that we do. And so each one of those will have another 20. And then we have another five to seven small venues, which are for soloists, um, usually three to eight musicians. So we run about 12 to 13 venues um, per day during the festival. So we see a lot of kids go through, and they have a, they have a lot of opportunity. And that's kindergarten through college. Uh, so a lot, of, uh, a lot of things take place for those students. Now, 
they're not performing, they have some great opportunities to learn from some incredible music educators.